Welcome to Inspirational Journeys, everyone. My name is Ann Harrison, and today I am happy to introduce to you children's book author Barbara Mojica. And she has a very in um, interesting little children's book series about American history, which one of the books I actually read. So welcome to the show, Barbara. Thank you, Ann. I'm really happy to have an opportunity to talk with you and your listeners today. Thank you so much. So, why don't you introduce yourself to the listeners and viewers? Okay. Well, I am a historian uh, by education. That's my background, gra uh, graduate and undergraduate degrees in history. But I have a long career in education. So after receiving my degrees, I decided I wanted to work with children. So I began teaching in elementary school. And I did that for 30 years. Oh, no, not 30 years. It was a, um, over 20 years. And during the course of that time, I became aware that a lot of children's needs weren't being met in the traditional education setting. And I became acutely aware that children learn in many different ways. So I went back to school again and I took a certification in special education. And I spent the next 20 years of my career working with children uh, that had uh, special needs. So I worked with autistic children, Down syndrome children, physically impaired children, uh, crack cocaine babies, and so on. And I worked with them both in a school setting and an individual setting. Eventually, I got into administration. I became a principal of a special ed school and later a school district administrator that arranged services for special needs children in a very large city in New York City. So my career really centered on education, but I never lost that love of history. So while I'm a parent, a grandparent, I am a, a teacher, but I wanted to put all of that together somehow. So when I finally did retire from my education career, I decided I wanted to write a series uh, of books about history to make history exciting and to help children utilize uh, their backgrounds, their cultures, their family, their communities, and to help them become better people, both for living a better life today and hopefully leaving a legacy for the future. So that's when I started my writing of children's books, and that's where I am today. That's what I was going to ask, what, what inspired you to become a writer, but you've went through that after you know being an educator for so long so um well yeah if you want to elaborate a little bit more on what inspired you to become a writer period I mean was there any specific inspiration before I mean was it just in the education sector or was there you know more to it than that no well for the first thing I did after I retired is I began to write a series of short uh, passages connected to history. And the title of uh, my series is Passages. And I still write for this local newsletter. I've been doing that for more than 10 years now. That's where I started. So I wrote a short kind of uh, one page articles uh, connecting uh, our everyday lives with history. So uh, I wrote that series and I am still writing that series, but I, I still wanted to stay connected with children and teaching. So actually it was my husband who had the idea of creating this character, Little Miss History. Oh, I love that. <laughs> who would narrate the series, make the children feel as if they were a part of this experience. And uh, my husband is an artist and illustrator who's been drawing his entire life. And uh, he also does some writing, but he does drawing in many, many different fields. So he's done science fiction. He's done children's books in the past. And he suggested creating this character. So we created Little Miss History. And Little Miss History is a cartoon-like character. 
Uh, and she's actually kind of a composite of me. Uh, she's a, a kind of a teenager who uh, is inquisitive, who loves to travel, and that was always me. Uh, even though I didn't have the opportunity to travel until I was an adult because my parents uh, didn't have a lot of extra money for travel. And in fact, we didn't even have a car. So I didn't get around very much, but I always had that yearning to find out about what people did and, and where they explored and what they learned about. So th here's a little Miss History. She looks like uh, a younger version of me, she wears these pigtails. She wears rose colored glasses because she has an optimistic viewpoint of the world around her. She wears a kind of hiking or park ranger outfit, looks kind of like a campy outfit. And uh, I used to hike a lot and I used to uh, explore of uh, the mountains and the countryside. So that's another part of me. And then she wears these oversized boots that are, they look like hiking boots, but they're really in memory of my dad who had very, very large feet. So she's just <laughs> kind of a funny me. And I want kids uh, of all kinds to see themselves a bit of themselves in this character that they can be just like her and they can be drawn into the past to learn about how they can live better today, find out about themselves through other people, and then maybe learn something that they can take with them as they grow and become adults in the future. Wow. I love that. So, um, Let's talk about, uh, we'll, we'll delve into the books, but let's talk about your process. Um, do you outline your children's, your stories before you write them, or do you just do the research you need to do and then and then sit down to write them? Well, there's a, a multi-layer process. And for most of my books, uh, I visit the site first. So with a few exceptions, um, like the North Pole book, for instance, I haven't visited that site. But most of the time, I go to the site with my husband, the illustrator, and we take our own photographs because the books are mixed media. Mm -hmm. So the books incorporate actual photographs of the site. They have portraits of the people that we talk about. So those are hand-drawn portraits. Uh, there are also uh, photographs uh, that are pertinent to the story incorporated with them. So that's what I mean by a, a mixed media approach. Most of the drawings, uh, the drawings of Little Miss History are hand drawn and they're done in watercolor. Uh, and then they are later, of course, in, imported into the background uh, and laid out with the rest of the, of the photography. So the first step is usually visiting the site. I choose my subjects uh, based on my previous knowledge of working with children of all types and the kinds of things that they might be interested in. My books are targeted in general for a kindergarten through grade six audience, but because they are picture books, they're so highly visual. I have fans that are preschoolers who are interested because they just immerse themselves in the picture of the story. Um, I have adults who love the books because they find out all kinds of things that they didn't know before. Yeah. So I there's a there's there's kind of a you know a wide uh, a range there. But the, as far as the writing process, um, so visiting the site is usually first. Then um, I do research. Um, both with primary source materials and um, the internet. I then take my research, look at it, and I write a first draft. I do not do an outline. I write a first draft. And then comes the kind of tedious part because for a children's book, you have to bear things down to uh, basics and mm -hmm. 
uh, because it is an illustrated book that falls more into the picture book genre than the chapter book genre. Uh, I keep the books generally, um, they're all under a thousand words. Most of them uh, hit between 600 and 800 words. Mm -hmm. So it requires revision, revision, revision. So I will usually rewrite that uh, script about a dozen times before I get it uh, down to where I want it. After I have the finished script, then we uh, we go to uh, illustration phase, and I take that finished script, I give it to my husband, and he looks at it and does thumbnails uh, for the layout. So he visualizes how he thinks we have to show these things. And that's the first step. Uh, after that, there may sometimes be a case where his pictorial visualization doesn't quite jive with the, with the written manuscript. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I may have to make minor tweaks like reverse the order of things and so on. So then he does the actual finished drawings after the thumbnail. So he does the drawings of the little miss character where she's going to be he lays out where the photography is going to be what what the background is going to be and then we go over the whole thing again uh we do minor tweaks again uh, seeing what works what doesn't work and the last step would be for him to do the graphic layout now um we have a small publishing company because my husband used to do some publishing of his own work. Ah. So we are the publishing company and we do everything but the actual print of the book. So he does the layout, uh, formats the book, and we uh, go through it one last time. On my end, at the same time, I am doing research to find the keywords mm -hmm. that we're going to be using when we uh, import this book into a uh, printer and to uh, online bookstores like, and online sites like Amazon, Barnes and Noble and so on. I'm doing the work on keywords, the categories and uh, the preliminary marketing uh, mm -hmm. of the book. So when we're all done with everything and the book is uploaded to the printer, uh, then we wait for the uh, copy to come back, do one last final proofread, and um, then the, the book is ready for publication. So do you hire an editor or do you do your own editing? Uh, I have uh, various uh, beta readers who do most of my editing. I am an English minor. So okay. I do a lot of the uh, editing myself, uh, but I do have uh, a whole series of beta readers, including um, fellow children's book readers uh, and authors who uh, give me a lot of advice and input as well. Oh, okay. So, and I do want to say that I loved how um, the the Little Miss History series, the the um, what is it? Independence Hall, the the one, the the latest one. I love how that one. Um, it's like wa taking it's it's teaching history, but it's also as if it's taking you through the to through a tour of Independence Hall and the Natural Museum of History. It's like it. What what gave you the idea to do that 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 special? It's like a tour guide kind of walk through in a children's book well because i would like as many children as possible to be immersed in in history not just looking at it as a subject to learn in school uh, i think uh it's not taught very well uh it's very often neglected these days and uh, it's relegated, you know, to being a minor part of the curriculum today. Everything is meeting the standards 
Uh, we have to come up to a certain math standard. We have to come up to a certain reading standard. And our schools have been falling further and further behind. Uh, as we used to be at the top, uh, uh, United States educational systems used to be at the top. And we have fallen way, way, way behind. So in an uh -huh. effort to put all of our emphasis on testing and uh, I know. A, a common unified way of yeah. teaching. Yeah. I think we've lost a lot. Again, I believe that ch ch children learn in many different ways and right. teachers should have the opportunity to teach in the way that they know is best suited to their students. And a lot of that is not happening today. You know, we're right. teaching from the top down. It's an administration and a, uh, uh, a lot of it is a government focus because so much of the money now is uh, grant and government funded right. that the uh, the schools are being forced to meet a certain uh, criteria. But that's well, not a certain criteria and they're being restricted um, in the ability to choose their own resources and to see what what actually works with their students. Right, I have a daughter who's in school. I can't even do her math. I mean, th that's that's the thing. They aren't teaching practical life skills anymore. They're teaching this high, this 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 math that's, and these subjects that are, you know, more geared towards STEM, which that is, um, what is it? Science, science, technology, math. Science, and technology. Uh, math and engineering. Magic, math and education. And uh, yeah, and then, and our engineering and math is what it is, science, technology, engineering, and math. But and a lot of these students and a lot of these kids may not want to go into a STEM field. So I, I agree. It's it, they're 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 shooting themselves in the foot doing it that way. And there are children that uh, are hands-on learners and children who are drawn to a vocational type of education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that isn't funded adequately. Uh, and it's, in fact, it's, it's pretty much discouraged. Uh, everyone, it's believed that everyone must uh, take courses in uh, what is quote, uh, social emotional learning and, uh, you know, yeah. or how, how to, uh, get along with others. These are all skills that I think um, these basic kinds of skills are taught in the home when the child is very young. And the brain has to be developed like any other part of our body. And the brain is clearly developed most intensely when a child is very, very young. So right. most of these things are really um, taught by the parent in the home before a child even gets to school. So in effect, sometimes we're trying to have children unlearn things that they've already learned in an effort to make them all, again, meet some kind of unified, you know, like idealistic and, 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 and who determines what is good for an individual child. It certainly shouldn't be somebody from up on high who doesn't even know the child as, as an yeah. individual. And I was going to say, education is one, not, they, they, they want to make it a one size fits all approach, but it's not. Definitely not. And I think mm -hmm. parents uh, deserve to have more of a choice uh, in what is an appropriate fit for their child. And that's why we're seeing so many parents now. And of course, COVID exacerbated this because parents became acutely aware of what was being taught in the schools. A lot of parents didn't like what they saw and mm -hmm. they saw their uh, children struggling uh, and they, they became aware, well, maybe there is a different or a better way for my child to learn. So, you know, today more and more parents are thinking about homeschooling. Yep. They're thinking about a charter school uh, that emphasizes a particular interest or passion that a child has. And I think charter schools are excellent for that. You know, uh, my own children uh, attended uh, 
uh, a combination of schools. They started out in private school uh, and then uh, they became involved with, with uh, a public school that was kind of a magnet school, uh, not, not uh, exactly a charter school, but a school that catered to a child's special interest. So one of my ch children went to a school that taught um, the arts and music. Uh, which was a very beneficial background uh, for him. He didn't become a musician. He didn't become an artist, but his education incorporated a multitude of things that allowed him to be a much more diverse individual who had the ability, you know, to look at different possibilities and then uh, fit the one, you know, that, that was best for him. And, and eventually that wound up being business. Uh, but, you know, we can't put our children in boxes. I, I think mm -hmm. it's very, very important uh, for everyone to find a path that works for he or she and follow it and, and for parents and uh, teachers to, uh, encourage that right and when I was in college I learned about the various learning styles and I'm like okay why doesn't the school system do this but anyway we we digress so um but I absolutely love the the Little Miss History series because even with the one book and I could see the others um the other books d doing the same going down that same path it teaches history in a way that's fun and exciting instead of the dull dull textbook style that we had to learn in school and I and I really appreciate that so do you have any advice for um writers or oh yeah I you know I went into uh writing knowing really nothing about the world of writing or publishing or marketing I I don't have a business background i you know, I took basic courses in high school in business, like bookkeeping, and I even took stenography, typing, those kind of things way back in the day when they, they were very, very appropriate. But uh, again, I used those things to help me uh, earn money when I was going through college, and they proved very, that was a skill that proved very useful to me, even though I might not use that now and I don't have a career related to any of that it was something that I learned and incorporated uh, you know as a part of me but as far as uh, authors I try to help authors I think authors should realize that fellow authors are not their competitors that they, they should be their best friends because uh, authors can do so much to help each other and uh, especially in a day where there is so much independent publishing and uh, the the conglomerate publishing companies cater to a very small audience and they have a very narrow focus in the types of works that they're looking for. Now, uh, independent authors have an opportunity to write about the things they're passionate about. And I think authors have to have a real passion. You cannot become an author and think you're going to make another money. You're going to be the next James Patterson or the next Dean no. Koontz because that is 99% of the time that is not going to happen. Mm -hmm. You have to have something that you are really interested in and something that you feel is important enough to share with other people. And uh, you have to have a really thick skin because it isn't easy. And you will have more days where you feel like you're hitting your head against the wall than there will be days when it's you know, wonderful. Like the day you receive an award for your book, that's like fantastic and it makes you feel so good. And, and fortunately I've you know, received about two dozen awards for my books and that makes me feel great. But the next day something might happen where I'm like, oh, you know, no, not, a, you know, another roadblock. Mm -hmm. So you have to really uh, be persistent and you have to, develop a thick skin and have a lot of patience because it doesn't happen overnight 
it, you know, it's something that you're going to have to work on every day. And that's why I say, if you don't have that fire and there's something that you don't really feel strongly about, uh, you're going to have great difficulty, you know, succeeding because it has to be something within you that you need to do. Um, mm -hmm. And I, uh, I've done a few videos for authors. I, I did a couple of videos with Christine Calabrese, who uh, is a fellow uh, author. And uh, we did a, one video on uh, how to self-publish children's books and, you know, like 21 tips on getting started, things that I kind of learned along the way. Mm -hmm. And we did another one for uh, book fairs and, you know, how to find uh, book fairs to work with and, and how to successfully set up, you know, the practical things that you have to do, the physical things that you have to do as an author. You have to take your books and you got to pack your books and you got to schlep them to a site and then you have to make a, a book display and then you have to have materials to give the people that come to visit you and uh, there are all kinds of nitty gritty pop you know things that you don't even think of like what do you do mm -hmm. when it rains what do you do when uh uh w the way you plan things to go just falls apart and you know they change the time they change the place they change the setting you know all kinds of things like that um and i network with authors i i i, I I found some resources that are really good for others. Uh, I write, I have a blog and on my blog, I do book reviews for families. I review books for everyone from infancy through adult, but I also try to give tips and uh, uh, for teachers, for parents and for authors. So on my, uh, on my blog, I do, uh, write articles from time to time on authors and you know how to network how to work together how to how to succeed what what to look for what not to look for um and that kind of thing mm, okay so um and you said you have another book coming out first of all uh, before we get into that uh do you have one of your books that you can that you can show on the video so that the viewers you know to give a visit. Um, would you like me to show the Independence Hall or a different Sure. Hall? Independence Hall, that's fine. Okay, so this is the 12th book in the series. Uh, it's Little Miss History Travels to Independence Hall. Now, this one, I try to combine uh, pretty much uh, all of the sites in the Philadelphia uh, area that are related mm -hmm. to... Uh, our independence. The United States is the longest existing federal constitution. But well, we start out the book with um, Elfritz Alley, and um, we talk about the old houses uh, that are still in existence. So this is an example of uh, children can walk down the street and see the way people lived in the 17 and 1800s, the actual buildings, and people still live in them today. So I included that in the book. Uh, we also include, of course, Independence Hall, where the Declaration of Independence was signed. Edmund Woolley was the uh, architect for the building. And we talk about you know, where uh, the Bill of Rights were signed. We talk about uh, where the early Congress met. We talk about uh, the Declaration of Independence uh, being written to replace uh, the Articles of Confederation, which were too weak. Uh, I talk about the architecture outside the building, the Statue of Washington, that children actually saved pennies to build this oh, wow. statue of George yeah, Washington. That. They contributed money. And we talk about John Barry, the Commodore of the Navy. Then we go through uh, how they, for the first 10 years, the federal government actually met 
uh, in Philadelphia. So we, we show the chair that George Washington sat in, the inkwell that was used to sign documents. We show where the, where the Congress met, uh, the early House of Representatives and the Senate. We talk about how they chose the way to set up the government, how there were different ideas. Uh, our founding fathers lived during the time of the Enlightenment, and they were influenced by these philosophers in Europe, like Locke and Rousseau. And uh, it, it was just a combination of the greatest minds of the time happening to, be li to live and be born uh, together in America at this time but also what was going on in the rest of the world. There are always in history connections to what else is going on. So the connections to all of these developments of philosophy and enlightenment had a big part in, in uh, their being able to visualize for the first time a government that wasn't a monarchy, that wasn't a dictatorship, but something that was coming from all of the people. And then we talk about the Museum of the American Revolution. That is a fantastic place. Uh, and it has 3D uh, uh, visual dimensions. It has hands-on experiences where children can hold the actual kinds of rifles that were used during the uh, revolution. Wow. It has uh, videos. Uh, of characters from the time talking about the events. So we talk about some of the things that led to the revolution, the Stamp Act, the, the taxes on tea in glass and, you know, throwing the tea into Boston yeah, Harbor. Yeah, the, tea, Little the Boston Miss Tea History. Party was one that stood out for me. And uh, we show um, uh, Concord, the first attack, the first military battle. Then I talk about Ralph Waldo Emerson. Now, all, all of a sudden, we have poetry introduced. Well, <laughs> the poetry, Ralph Waldo Emerson, he actually wrote that poem, The Shot Heard Around the World, and it was a hymn, uh, really. It was intended more or less to be sung, uh, but um, today it's, it's widely thought of as a poem. But I include that just to give children an appreciation also of literature and how with history, there's always connections to other disciplines. So we're talking about military history here. We're talking about political history, the kind of government. We're talking about military history and uh, battles uh, that were going on to win our independence. So we talk about George Washington losing uh, in, uh, in New York City, having to evacuate, then going to Trenton, crossing the Delaware in the dead of night, defeating the Hessians and the British, and then uh, spending that harsh winter at Valley Forge. Uh, and we talk about, again, how they suffered frostbite and lack of food and struggled to survive. So then we finally get to the end of the war. We talk about the surrender of the British and how what seemed to be an impossible task finally came to be. Uh, we, then we talk about the government, how they decided on a plan that would allow both the small states and the large states to be happy. In, in this case, we're really talking about the colonies because the colonies had differences just like the states do today. Yep. So... Uh, the Virginia plan proposed said there would be uh, two chambers and everything would be based on the population. And the New Jersey plan said that, well, we'll have uh, two, we'll have one chamber and every everyone will have an equal vote. But what they came up with was called the Connecticut Compromise because Connecticut proposed it uh, was a two chamber house in which one would have representatives based on population that satisfied smaller areas and then one uh, of, of the larger areas rather and then the one that would be based um, on uh, an equal number the senate today uh, in which every every state or would have an equal representation so then we talk about um, finally uh, we talk about the pic we we look at the picture of washington's actual tent 
where he lived uh, during uh, during his time during the Revolutionary War. I don't know, maybe able to see that a little bit. And we also talk about uh, the burial ground at Christ Church where Benjamin Franklin and other revolutionary notables are buried. That's fascinating walk through history because you can just walk through and see the graves of all of these famous people. Mm. And finally, we talk about the Liberty Bell and how the Liberty Bell is a symbol that was so, so important to people that came later in history, not just during the Revolutionary War time and ringing the Liberty Bell to proclaim our freedom, but it became a, an iconic symbol for suffragettes. It became an iconic symbol for abolitionists. It became a, a powerful symbol for Native Americans fighting for Native American rights. Mm. And uh, basically that goes, finishes our walk through the whole Independence Hall area. And then at the end, I ask children what hopes they have for a better future. Connecting, of course, again, to the Liberty Bell and, and their hopes and dreams. What do they envision? What can they hope and dream for to make better in the future? And they, of course, as our future leaders, will have a, a dramatic, uh, powerful part in that. So, I, for, so for those of you watching and listening today, I want to encourage you to go out and get this Little Miss History series for to share with your kids and with families. And you might even find some interesting facts in them yourself because it gives a, a, a it gives a new a new light to our history. It's not textbookish. It's actually you're walking through it like a like like you could I, I guess. And Barbara, you can correct me on this, but I guess you could say you're taking a virtual tour through our nation's history, through different elements of history by reading yes. this book. Yes, in a way, yes, a virtual tour, but um, a very interactive one. Uh -huh. Because I'm, I'm always asking children throughout all of my books what they think. Some books um, bring out the lives of people that probably they've never heard of and most likely their parents never heard of. Uh, like Alonzo Swan, who was a hero and during World War II on the, uh, on the Intrepid, or um, Anderson Affen Rubbett, who was a, uh, he was a surgeon during, during the Revolutionary War. One of the first uh, African-American surgeons who was born in Canada, but grew up in Chicago and became very, very successful uh, uh, he was actually at Ford's Theater during Lincoln's assassination and was a friend of the Lincoln family. So there are all kinds of things, you know, there's a secret room uh, behind the heads at Mount Rushmore. Most people don't know that and they don't know what's in it. Uh, there are, all, you know, all kinds of things that, you know, I want children to understand that history isn't just a series of famous people or famous events or uh, a, a, a rigid timeline, but it's a part of us every day. And we need to understand where we came from in order to understand how we can live better today. And then how to use all of that to build some kind of framework or legacy to create a plan to live better in the future. So we find out from, from history that some things didn't work we find out that some things did work very well. We find out that some things may need to be tweaked, but we have our basic framework that we can work with and we can always uh, use uh, as, as, uh, as our guideline, much as we use uh, the Bible as a guideline. You know, it, right. it's, it's kind of the rock uh, that we start with. Right. I agree. So where can people find you online? Well, the best place to find me is to go to the website. And it's easy to remember. The website is simply www.littlemisshistory.com. So littlemisshistory.com. If they go to the website, they can go anywhere uh, to my resources. So on my website, I have a direct uh, chat line and my email. 
I have a link to my, my books. Well, there's a preview of all of my books on the website, uh, testimonials, where to buy them. There is a link to my blog. If they go to my blog, they can find those book reviews. I do two a week. And I also have the tips uh, for parents, authors, and teachers on the blog. I have a YouTube channel, which became very, very active during COVID because I wanted a way to reach out to people. Uh, and I do on my YouTube channel, mini teaching lessons. So every week I do a mini teach, I call it two minute teacher. And I do a mini lesson, not only on history, but all kinds of subjects. Uh, I do trivia challenges for adults. I do kids history videos. I have history, uh, videos of history. Uh, by kids, uh, talking oh. to kids about history. Cool. I have uh, videos about my books and videos related to the subjects in my books, so you can find out more, you know, about the various sites that I talk about. And I have tips for authors. I have those two videos I talked about. Uh, some tips for parents, things like how to be a better citizen, uh, how to understand. Um, the difference between fact and opinion, which is very important because uh, our news today is very skewed. We're not just yeah. given the facts, but we have to teach children how to differentiate between fact and opinion, opinion how to use social media well, right. how to understand that social media is skewed and we are not uh, getting uh, all the information we need, how to tell the difference between a fake, you know, and a, and a real, a real presentation. Uh, so things like that are all on my YouTube channel. And then I have um, a Pinterest board and I try to collect all my resources there. So if parents are looking for a book list or they're looking for uh, some information on uh, teaching character to kids or, uh, you know, finding uh, free activities for kids uh, uh, in different areas. My Pinterest board links to all of that. And of course, regular social media like my Little Miss History Facebook page and uh, Twitter and Instagram. And you, they just go to the appropriate link, click on it, and it will take them to that area. Okay. So now this is inspired by another podcast. So I'm going to ask you, do you have a call to action that listeners and viewers can do today? Like a, it could be a challenge. It could be a resource, whatever. What's your call to action for the day? Okay. My call to action is to become aware of history in your everyday life. How can you become a part of history? Take a walk in the community and notice history in your community. What is it that brings your community together? Did they come together because of a specific culture initially? Did they come together because they were drawn to a particular job? Uh, in my community, I live in a community that was founded in the 1600s. And uh, it was originally a Dutch community. Uh, it was originally the site of mills. Um, so we have, we still have the waterfalls. We still have lots of markers that indicate historical buildings and what they were used for. So if parents take children around their community, they can begin to see that they are part of history with the family parents can can go into their family history start with the family because that's the basic unit of history every family has a history talk about your ancestors talk about where they lived what they did how it was the same and how it was different from today you know just developing an awareness uh, of of how each one of us needs to be a cognizant of the fact of our place. We're, we're not islands. We're not little islands, but we are all connected. And um, we, we must understand that 
we are a part of a family. Everything in the world has a history. We're part of a community, a local community. We're part of a government, a, a, a country, and then we're part of a worldwide community. And if we do that, I think we'll be able to develop empathy, more compassion, uh, more respect for each other and begin to communicate better with each other um, on, uh, on a very kind of even playing field. So if we all understand we're all important, but we're all a part of something bigger than ourselves. I love that. So I'm going to close with my own challenge. We challenge you today to go out there and read to get inspired, write something inspiring, and share your creation with the world. For when you've touched one life, you've touched thousands. Thanks for joining us on Inspirational Journeys, everyone. And remember, your story matters. Thank you for being on Inspirational Journeys, Barbara, and everyone have a blessed day.